Okay, um, welcome everyone to this afternoon's symposium on cardiothoracic transplantation. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I think most people do, but for those that don't, um, I'm Mike Higgins, um, and I'm the medical director here um, at the Golden Jubilee Hospital. Um, it's hard to believe that it's now well over a quarter of a century um, since the first heart transplant was, 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 was done in Glasgow, and over 10 years since um, transplantation was consolidated here um, under the Advanced Heart Failure Service at the Golden Jubilee. Um, and I say that hard to believe um, with some personal context as well, um, because it was heart transplantation that first drew me into an interest in cardiothoracic anaesthesia as a career. Um, and my own career, as many of you know, um, has been wound one way or another, bound up um, with the progress um, of the heart failure service and the transplant service um, here at the Golden Jubilee. So this afternoon, I think we've got a real treat in store and um, I think we're, I'm certainly really looking forward um, to, to, to all the talks today. We have three very distinguished um, and definitive speakers, um, and I'm not going to hug the podium any longer. I'm going to pass straight on to Phil um, to open the proceedings. Thank you. So I'm just going to give a very quick summary of history of transplantation in Scotland, just to put it in context for this uh, so basically, I've just got three slides. And basically, I don't know if people remember, I don't know this long, uh, Professor Philip Caves is a distinguished uh, Northern Irish surgeon that trained, <laughs> <laughs> trained, trained in Brompton and then went to uh, Stanford University with uh, Norman Shomway. And basically, he pioneered in 1972 percutaneous transvenous endomyocardial biopsy and um, developed this biotome, which is news to this day, 46 years on. As I say, this, is, this was a big step in the early diagnosis of rejection after transplant. Uh, at that stage, transplants were only going, heart transplants, four years, so the first one in 1967. Still the gold standard today uh, for biopsies. He came back to Glasgow in 1975, uh, uh, Professor of Cardiac Surgery, and very sadly, unexpectedly died three years later while playing squash. So at that time, everybody thought he was, he was going to be the person that did the first transplant in the UK, but subsequently died very early on. Professor Wheatley succeeded him in 1979. And in 12-13 years, they, they set up the Scottish Heart Transplant Programme in 1991. First transplant was done on the 1st of January 1992. And the last slide that people don't remember, uh, I never knew this till a while ago, the very, <coughs> this uh, esteemed thoracic surgeon, Andrew Logan, Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, um, did the first single lung transplant in the UK and Europe in May 1968, which is six days after the first heart transplant in the UK by Donald Ross, but didn't get the same accolades or publicity. It was actually the world's fifth ever lung transplant and a young 15-year-old from the islands had uh, drunk accidentally and ingested weed killer. And um, that was the first lung transplant in the UK. The uh, patient only survived 14 days due to complications of the, the weed killer, but uh, it's a very forgotten fact that uh, so there's links in Scotland to, to transplantation. And that's, I'm going to hand over now to Professor Carmelo Milano. He's very kindly came over, he's over from the US and uh, he's a Professor of Cardiac Surgery at Duke University and uh, Chair of Adult Cardiac Surgery. Thank you. And Transplantation in Bath, so I'll pass him over. Uh, thank you and I'd just like to thank the sponsors. Uh, um, Abbott and Transmedics and the uh, NHS Educational Foundation for sponsoring this uh, meeting. Um, I'm going to speak uh, about mechanical circulatory support for chronic heart failure and then later in the discussion touch on the topic of mechanical circulatory support for bridging patients to cardiac transplantation. Uh, before I begin though, uh, I would just point out that uh, I uh, 
I have done some training in the UK, and after my uh, cardiac surgery training, I actually did a transplant fellowship training at Papworth Hospital, and I uh, benefited a great deal from this um, experience. Uh, part of uh, what I uh, gleaned from this was a better understanding of the history of cardiac transplantation, which was really an important transatlantic collaboration. Uh, I worked at Papworth 20 years ago, and the summer when I arrived there, uh, a celebration was ongoing, which was the commemoration of a building, but they invited Norman Shumway, uh, who was one of the first surgeons to do cardiac transplantation in the United States, to commemorate uh, the building. But it was more than a building commemoration, and uh, there are, this was a photograph taken at that celebration when I was starting my fellowship. I didn't know all these people at the time, but I've become, you know, appreciate their importance now, but uh, a number of UK surgeons uh, traveled uh, to Stanford and engaged with Shumway and learned the technique of cardiac transplantation. But Stanford University also benefited from collaborations with people like Philip Caves, who developed endomyocardial biopsy, and also, of course, Roy Kahn, who introduced the use of cyclosporin uh, following cardiac transplantation, which was an immunosuppressant that truly enabled a long-term survival. So uh, there's a rich uh, transatlantic collaboration, which I uh, witnessed uh, having worked at Papworth. Um, however, uh, one of the limitations of transplantation in general is the uh, disparity between the amount of organ failure and the number of suitable uh, donors for transplantation. And this is an example of that problem. Uh, shown here is the state that I work in, North Carolina. And you can see there are several uh, transplant centers, and we do uh, over 100 heart transplants per year in our state. But if you look at death certificates, there's over 4,000 patients that have uh, heart failure listed as one of the causes of mortality. So there's a huge disparity between the 100 transplants that we're able to offer these patients and the 4,000 deaths annually due to heart failure. And the remaining talks will focus on some efforts to increase the uh, number of donors that are available for uh, heart and other types of transplantation. But I still think there's going to be a huge disparity and uh, the huger problem of chronic or end-stage heart failure needs other avenues of support or treatment. So upon returning to Duke, I was very focused on uh, utilization of mechanical pumps or LVADs for chronic support of patients who would not qualify for cardiac transplantation due to, you know, a variety of reasons. And the first uh, device that we engaged with as a destination therapy was the uh, Pulsatile uh, HeartMate 1 or XVE, which is shown uh, at this point in the works, is shown right here. This was a very large device, and we, uh, this became FDA approved as a bridge, as not as a bridge to transplant, but as a destination therapy. And several hundred patients were treated with this as a destination therapy. It was not a, it, it was by most accounts not a successful therapy because the device had durability issues and reproducibly failed due to uh, issues with the valves and with the bearings at about one or one and a half years. So a number of years later, the HeartMate 2 was introduced, which is also shown in this picture, which was a type of continuous flow, a rotary flow pump. And the continuous flow was adapted in part to introduce greater durability and see if, if uh, patients could live longer and avoid need for replacements. And these are some of the results, pure survival results, which emanated from some of the trials with the uh, XVE product, the HeartMate 1, and the HeartMate 2. And you can see that the lowest, uh, the lowest curve down here is the survival plot for patients with advanced heart failure without LVAD support, with most of the patients expiring by two years. These middle curves were the type of survival benefit that we achieved with the HeartMate 1 or the HeartMate XVE, the pulsatile device that had impaired durability. But then with the HeartMate 2, there was important additional 
uh, incremental increase in survival outcomes at two years, with now 60 or maybe 70 percent of patients surviving to two years. And this, this improvement in survival outcomes really uh, allowed the uh, durable LVAD destination therapy strategy to take off at our center and I think in the United States and in other parts of the world. So with the HeartMate 2 results, it was, it was clear that this rotary pump uh, design achieved greater durability. There were really, you know, to this date, although I'm going to talk about problems with the HeartMate 2, the actual mechanical device had no failures. So it was remarkably durable relative to the XVE, which developed uh, issues with the valves and with the uh, uh, bearings. It was observed both with the XVE and with the HeartMate 2 that patients with a fair bit of biventricular dysfunction could actually experience resolution of their heart failure with just left ventricular replacement with one of these LVADs. Uh, and there were concerns before the HeartMate 2 trials that the loss of pulsatility might impair end organ recovery like improvement in kidney function, but that actually was not seen because patients uh, supported with the HeartMate 2 experienced uh, you know, important uh, and sustained uh, recovery of renal function and other end organs. So this, again, really helped this idea of destination therapy gain traction, although still an imperfect therapy and not certainly not equivalent to cardiac transplantation. But it did lead to substantial increases in the application of durable LVADs as, you know, predominantly for destination therapy. And this shows some of the volumes uh, uh, at Duke, and you can see that uh, durable LVAD implantations incrementally have increased over the last decade to current, uh, our current state where we're doing about 150 durable LVADs a year. Most of these, again, are for patients who would not qualify for cardiac transplantation or, or who were deemed ineligible for cardiac transplantation. And this was also experienced uh, you know, and many other centers in the United States. With the pulsatile device, this type of increased volume or increased application didn't occur, but with the HeartMate 2 results, uh, there was much greater application and, and application of destination therapy. And I believe that there's almost 25,000 HeartMate 2 implants worldwide with a number of patients living more than five or 10 years with the device. Um, However, like all good things, uh, the HeartMate 2 had issues. And interestingly, those issues weren't immediately apparent. We started using the HeartMate 2 uh, around 2005, but almost uh, a decade later, we began recording and identifying an issue with thrombosis. And um, this syndrome was identified as patients who would develop hemolysis. Uh, and then subsequent uh, recurrence of heart failure. Basically, the LV unloading that the pump achieved would be lost because the pump was no longer effective because it had, it had material in it, uh, which was causing hemolysis and pump dysfunction. Um, interestingly, before 2011, this was not well described. And, and in fact, in the early trials with HeartMate 2, we would never measure hemolysis laboratory like uh, LDH or plasma-free hemoglobin, but currently we commonly measure those, those uh, parameters to uh, try to identify this issue of pump thrombosis. Working with two other centers, Duke, uh, Washington University, and the Cleveland Clinic published this report in 2014, which demonstrated this acute increase in this problem of pump thrombosis. You can see that around 2011 or 2012, the incidence of confirmed pump thrombosis went from about 1% to roughly 10%. And I believe that that incidence of about 10% uh, pump thrombosis has persisted despite a lot of investigation and a lot of effort to try to understand why this has occurred. And you can see in this study, all three institutions really experienced the same uh, problem around 2011. Furthermore, although this can occur at any time after HeartMate 2 support is initiated, it would frequently occur about three months after the implant, which was very unfortunate for patients because they would receive an LVAD and three months later you'd have to approach the patient about having the device replaced. 
uh, which is obviously very difficult on patients and uh, uh, very concerning to the providers. This slide illustrates that if you replace the HeartMate II pump or either by removing it and doing a surgical replacement of the pump or by transplanting the patient, uh, survival would, uh, you know, uh, decline substantially or mortality would decline substantially and patients had good survival outcomes. But if the pump was not removed, uh, patients had a very poor survival outcome with, uh, the slide shows, 40 or 50 percent mortality within three or four months from the diagnosis of pump thrombosis. So we discovered a new problem with the HeartMate II uh, that occurred at about 10 percent of the patients we implanted, and it was very concerning, and it wasn't really responding to different strategies to try to mitigate the problem. But what I'm going to talk about next is our experience with HeartMate 3, and quite frankly, the solution to the HeartMate 2 pump thrombosis problem has really been the HeartMate 3, because we haven't solved the HeartMate 2 pump thrombosis problem, but initiation of a newer device has, uh, as I will show you, has achieved, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, correction of this problem. So the, the HeartMate 3 is an interesting pump, and it uh, has specific uh, characteristics designed into it, and these characteristics were in part in response to the issues of thrombosis that were experienced with the HeartMate 2. Two important strategies were, one, to increase the gaps between the rotor and the housing of the HeartMate 3 so that if material entered the pump, uh, that it would not increase shear force or heat and lead to hemolysis, as was occurring with the heart rate 2 pump thrombosis. The other important change was uh, there was a pumps, uh, an algorithm for pump speed change, which led to uh, what is sometimes referred to as an artificial pulse, but there was a pump speed change every, every two seconds, so 30 times a minute there was uh, a washing or uh, a pump speed change, which you know, was designed to try to improve washing in the pump and, again, mitigate against problems such as pump thrombosis and stroke. So these were design changes that were instituted by engineers. We hoped that they would improve outcomes, and the momentum, the momentum trial was undertaken comparing the HeartMate 3 device to the HeartMate 2. And in this trial, we uh, included patients who were both destination therapy patients who were not eligible for transplant and also patients who are being bridged to transplant. Um, this illustrates the design of the study. Many of you have probably seen this design, but more than 1,000 patients were ultimately randomized to receive the HeartMate 2 versus the HeartMate 3, and the results from the entire 1,000 patient cohort are going to be reported, I think, within the year. But what I'm going to show you is a subset of those patients that were reported on earlier this year who reached a two-year follow-up time point. So 366 patients have, from this trial have, uh, you know, already reached an endpoint, uh, 190 versus a randomized to HeartMate 3 versus 170 to HeartMate 2. The primary endpoint for the trial was not just survival, although I'll show you the survival outcomes. It, the primary endpoint was an endpoint that, that uh, was positive if the patient survived avoided need for reoperation uh, or replacement of the pump and avoided a disabling stroke. So it was really a more comprehensive endpoint that, that captured more than just survival. And I think that's important because merely surviving uh, is not the most important thing if you suffer important comorbidities such as need for major reoperation or dis disabling stroke. Uh, mo about half of the patients had ischemic cardiomyopathy. The average age was about 60 in both groups. Uh, the vast majority, almost 90 percent of patients in both groups were on continuous intravenous inotropic support, and uh, about 10 or 15 percent were on balloon pumps, as shown in, in these baseline characteristics. The majority of patients were Intermax uh, profile 2 or 3, and the majority of patients in this U.S. trial were deemed destination therapy, that is, they did not qualify or were not listed for cardiac transplantation at the time they were uh, implanted. This illustrates the primary endpoint. The uh, 
The HeartMate 3 was superior in this primary endpoint, which consisted of survival, free of disabling stroke, and free of need for device replacement. This was a statistically significant advantage for the HeartMate 3 at two years versus the HeartMate 2. Now, when you break down the, prime, the composite endpoint, uh, you can see that uh, survival was numerically different, but not statistically different in this 300-plus this, uh, patient cohort. Now, this may prove to be statistically different in the larger 1,000 patient report, which is upcoming. But I would, I would point to this as a sign of further improvement in durable LVAD outcomes, because at two years, with the HeartMate 3, there's an 83% uh, survival shown up here in the blue curve. And that uh, is a survival outcome that's very similar to cardiac transplantation. Uh, you know, if you look at cardiac transplantation, the two-year survival outcome is somewhere between 85 and 90 percent, depending upon which center you're at. But but the HeartMate 3 survival outcome at two years is a, is very much approaching the uh, survival outcome that is achieved with cardiac transplantation. So this shows you know very uh, very good um, survival outcome. And bear in mind that many of these patients were deemed ineligible for cardiac transplantation, so they had a number of risk factors or comorbidities that had disqualified them from receiving cardiac transplantation. So again, uh, overall survival outcome was, was quite good, but not, not statistically different between the two. The incidence of disabling stroke was about 3% per year, but not different. The big difference between the two devices was that the HeartMate 3 avoided need for replacement. And uh, although there were a couple of replacements with the HeartMate 3, none of them were for pump thrombosis. Um, and there were uh, still an important 10% uh, per year incidence, greater than 10% per year incidence of pump, thrombo pump thrombosis with the HeartMate 2 device. So the HeartMate 3 device really proved to eliminate this issue of, of uh, pump thrombosis, which was a very important issue uh, with the HeartMate 2. Um, again, much different rates of reoperation. Uh, there were 21 cases of reoperation for the HeartMate 2, no cases of reoperation for re replacement of the device with the HeartMate 3. Also very encouraging was the decreased overall rate of stroke. You can see for the HeartMate 3, the overall rate of stroke in the trial was 10% versus 19% for the HeartMate 2. So this was another devastating complication of durable LVAD support, which appears to be diminished with the, uh, with the HeartMate 3 device. Importantly, some other important adverse events associated with durable LVAD support, such as GI bleeding, remain similar, with 27% of patients in both groups experiencing uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, and I'll show you in another slide here that the rate of right heart dysfunction was also similar between the two devices. But stroke was decreased, mainly from non-disabling strokes, but the overall incidence of freedom from stroke was better with HeartMate 3 than with the HeartMate 2 device. And we hope that the 1,000 patient cohort will continue to display this positive trend with reduced strokes. This is another important slide. It's a very co complex slide, but on the left two panels, you can see the six minute walks, uh, improvements, and the changes in New York heart uh, classification. You can, say that, you can see that at baseline, the patients enrolled in this trial, both uh, the ones that received the HeartMate 2 and the ones who received the HeartMate 3, none of them, you know, mo they were all class 4 patients, but with the LVAD support by six months, uh, almost 80, 80 or 90 percent of the patients achieved class 1 or class 2 symptoms with LVAD support. So there's a very important functional benefit, and that's also seen in the upper left panel where uh, we're looking at six-minute walk, where the average six-minute walk increases from about 150 to over 300 meters. And that's excluding patients who had been supported on balloon pumps who were completely non-ambulatory. So important functional improvements in addition to uh, the overall survival outcomes. So we begin, we, you know, we think this is an important, uh, you know, avenue of therapy for the many patients who do not qualify for cardiac transplantation who have severe end-stage heart failure. And again, hopefully the 
1,000 patient cohort will continue to reflect these benefits. And as you know, there are other devices in, in the development that will hopefully continue to impact some of the negative outcomes. But I'm going to shift gears just for a minute and move over to discussing the bridging strategies with mechanical circulatory support. And I will point out that many of the comments that I make are institutionally uh, driven. That is, different institutions in the United States really utilize different strategies to bridge patients to cardiac transplantation. But me mechanical circulatory support is very prevalently used to bridge patients to cardiac transplantation. And my message in the next few slides will be that one strategy to mechanically you know, bridge these patients is not suitable for all patient scenarios, and that you know, we you know, are going to utilize a number of different strategies. On the one hand, durable LVADs do improve a number of different aspects of patients, uh, such as improving their serum creatinine, their nutritional status, their physical reconditioning, and uh, durable LVAD support will decrease pulmonary vascular resistance, and all these things help make a, an individual patient a better transplant candidate. So some centers have moved towards utilization of durable LVAD in almost all their patients who are bridged to transplant. These are data from the SDS, and it shows that over the last decade, there is a, pro a progressive increasing incidence of use of durable LVAD to bridge patients. And you can see that on average, currently about 50% of patients are bridged to cardiac transplantation with one of these durable LVADs. And at some centers, this approaches even higher percentages. However, uh, you know, analyzing this further suggests that the duration of LVAD support before the transplant and the presence of adverse events on the LVAD negatively impact post-transplant survival. So this may not, you know, shifting to a, a situation where all patients are bridged with durable LVADs, I don't think is the optimal strategy. And I think many of these patients can, and can receive cardiac transplantation without uh, LVAD bridging. There are obvious technical difficulties, if you will, or increased technical uh, complexities with um, bridging with, with uh, durable LVAD. This is a patient who is about a year out from a durable LVAD, and what you see on the CT scan is a slightly dilated ascending aorta, and then on top of the ascending aorta is the outflow graft, and then juxtaposed is the sternum. And reentry in these patients is complex and precarious, and uh, this, the presence of the durable LVAD and a period of scarring from the durable LVAD lead to very complex reoperations. For example, this particular patient required a period of circulatory arrest in order to free up the, uh, the sternum and the anterior mediastinum and control this outflow graft, and those problems, I think, impacted the uh, you know, the uh, graft, the allograft function after the transplant. So when we do durable LVAD bridging, we can increase surgical complexity, and uh, that impacts outcomes. Th this illustrates another case where the right ventricle is, is uh, scarred heavily to the posterior sternum. And again, reentry and reoperation is, is complicated, and you know, we strive to achieve equivalent outcomes in, in these patients who are bridged with durable LVAD, but there is definitely increased technical complexity. The other important feature of durable LVAD support is an important incidence of stroke, and, the, and some of the strokes obviously are devastating, and patients who are being bridged with durable LVADs who suffer, for example, this type of intracranial hemorrhage generally don't recover to go on to be able to achieve uh, or be... Uh, offered cardiac transplantation. So stroke risk is another important downside to bridging with uh, durable LVAD support. So another strategy that's been investigated is using intraortic balloon pump. And these are data from the STS. And again, you know, there are 2,600 patients that were bridged with a durable LVAD versus uh, about 600 patients that were bridged with a, a predominantly femoral balloon pump. And what this study demonstrated was that certainly there's a cohort of patients, whether they have ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, who can be successfully bridged with intraortic balloon pump. Most of these cases, however, were 
femoral intraortic balloon pumps. And as we utilized this strategy at our center, uh, we identified some patients that were markedly deconditioned from prolonged bed rest that was required for the, for the uh, femoral balloon pump. So we began to look at uh, the use of axillary balloon pump, uh, catheter balloon pump support as a method to bridge certain patients. And we have utilized this increasingly. And one of our uh, trainees sort of reported on this in this publication. There are many centers now utilizing upper extremity catheter balloon pump support as a strategy to bridge people to cardiac transplantation. The advantage of this, though, is that it allows patients to get out of bed and be ambulatory and remain and maintain some element of, uh, you know, muscular tone and quality of existence while they wait for cardiac transplantation. So we've become more aggressive in trying to apply uh, catheter uh, balloon pump support from an axillary uh, artery. This is just a small illustration of, of uh, some of the technical aspects of doing this. Uh, you know, shown up here. First of all, I would say that this can be done percutaneously, and there are centers that are doing it percutaneously. I will say that our center, most of the cases we've done have not been percutaneous. They have, they have taken on this type of uh, uh, technique. Uh, the patient's head is kind of up here at the head of the screen. screen. The clavicle is shown here. And so a small incision is made in the delto pectoral groove. The axillary artery is exposed. And you can see that a small graft, a six millimeter Dacron graft, is applied to the axillary artery. And through that graft, uh, a wire is uh, directed into the descending uh, thoracic aorta. Once the wire is in position, the descending thoracic aorta, the wire can be tunneled out of the skin, remote from the incision, so that the catheter enters at a remote site. Uh, this is quite straightforward. Um, initially, uh, patients would be intubated for this, but this can be done under local anesthetic or with sedation. Um, this illustrates a fluoroscopic image of one of these uh, axillary balloon pumps. In this case, you can see the catheter, the balloon pump catheter coming from the right axillary artery. This can be introduced both from the right axillary and from the left axillary. As illustrated on this shot, Many patients have defibrillators in the left uh, axillary um, subclavicular area, which is a, is a bit of a confounder, but the balloon pump can be introduced, the catheter balloon pump can be introduced from the right or the left. Uh, and we've done, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably over 50 cases like this. Uh, we have identified a very low incidence of stroke. I think one of the obvious questions was, well, with this catheter traversing the the arch, um, is this an, an, an increased risk of stroke? And clearly, the, there may be some increased risk of stroke. I, I have seen cases of stroke, but the incidence of stroke is quite low, and I would say probably comparable to the stroke rate that we see with durable LVAD bridging. So we have, we have uh, gone to this uh, more and more, particularly in patients that have responded favorably to femoral balloon pump a patient will receive a femoral balloon pump if their hemodynamics responds favorably. The next step would be to transition them to an axillary balloon pump where they would uh, be able to get out of bed and, and be ambulatory. Um, now, just very quickly, there are also durable, more durable uh, counterpulsation devices that are being tested. Dr. Jeevanandam has designed a device which is termed uh, the IVIS device, the company is New Pulse, and this is a durable um, balloon pump device, which is most commonly inserted via the left axillary artery, again, through a uh, graft attached to the, the axillary artery. This technology has been described uh, in a small series presented uh, or published in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant earlier this year, in January. But basically, you can see in this, in this picture that the, uh, the, ca the catheter lies in the descending uh, thoracic aorta. There is a skin interface device that is subcutaneously implanted over the left chest wall that uh, you know, delivers the pneumatic uh, line to the device and also has uh, electrodes for obtaining an ECG uh, signal off of which the device is triggered. 
This illustrates the skin interface device that is also implanted, but this is all extrathoracic. There's no actual intrathoracic surgery with the implementation of this device. This illustrates the driver unit, which is bigger than the batteries that a patient would have uh, with uh, uh, durable LVAD support, but not much bigger. It's, it's quite mobile and patients can walk around and the, the hope is that uh, there would be a high rate of uh, discharging patients, not from ICUs, but from the hospital with this counterpulsation device. Currently, there is a feasibility trial that Duke is participating in. Uh, five to ten sites have been uh, utilized and the feasibility trial is supposed to include 50 patients. The majority of these patients are being considered for uh, bridge to transplant. Now, there are some limitations. The size of the axillary subclavian artery is important. With catheter balloon pump insertion, we don't really focus or worry much about the size of the axillary artery because the catheter is quite small. The catheter for this uh, new pulse device is larger and requires a uh, greater than seven millimeter diameter of subclavian artery. Uh, there are also rhythm considerations. Um, generally, patients with atrial fibrillation are not supported well with a new pulse device and probably uh, not supported that well with a catheter uh, uh, balloon pump uh, bridge strategy. The new pulse trial also requires uh, that the heart rate be less than 110 beats per minute because of issues tracking the heart rate much above that. So again, uh, the, the IVIS new pulse device offers certain advantages and also certain challenges relative to a catheter uh, axillary balloon pump as shown in this slide. Obviously the biggest potential advantage of this IVIS device and other types of counterpulsation devices that are in the development would be possible discharge from the hospital. The patient would actually go home with counterpulsation. Um, but this is a, a in, in trial, in a feasibility trial, which hopefully will be completed uh, soon. So just to review uh, our institutional strategy as I understand it or as I want to you know, try to describe it, we have a, a, a very liberal use of femoral balloon pump both for ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients awaiting transplant. If patients demonstrate a hemodynamic stability or a hemodynamic response to femoral balloon pump, we'll convert that to an axillary um, catheter balloon pump or potentially to this uh, IVIS device in the new pulse trial. Now, there are patients who will receive the uh, axillary catheter balloon pump and who may subsequently have decline in their hemodynamics and may need to be transitioned to durable LVAD, but I can tell you that, that that rate of decline has been quite low and we've been able to avoid uh, durable LVADs in many of our patients and our rate of uh, use of durable LVADs, you know, <coughs> relative to the national average is quite low. Um, there are patients who will need more than durable LVAD though and our most common strategy for biventricular mechanical support would be a durable LVAD for left ventricular replacement with a uh, temporary extracorporeal device for right-sided support, such as a rotaflow or um, uh, Centromag device. There are patients, however, who also require total artificial heart as a bridging strategy. These are typically patients who uh, lack a safe way of doing LV apical cannulation. And for total artificial heart, although there have been very few cases of this in our, in our center, we have utilized um, uh, uh, rotary flow uh, LVADs as uh, two of these devices as total artificial heart replacement. What is illustrated here is a patient who has had a ventriculectomy, bilateral ventriculectomy and HeartMate 3 sewing rings have been affixed to the mitral and tricuspid annulus. And what you're looking, you know, looking into those rings, uh, what you can see is the right and left atrium. Uh, and this patient went on to have two uh, HeartMate 3 devices shown here as biventricular replacement. And this was undertaken because uh, conventional apical cannulation for durable LVAD was not feasible and the patient had severe RV dysfunction. 
So, you know, in conclusion, uh, once, once, you know, size does not fit everybody in terms of bridging patients with mechanical circulatory support to cardiac transplantation, but we do see a, a heavy role for uh, balloon pump support, and in particular, uh, axillary balloon pump support that enables ambulation.